Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I have told some of this story before, but I thought it would be a good idea to tell the story again as a part of this week's Gospel at Work segment because it's really about what inspired the Gospel at Work segment. I'm going to take you back to 1973. I believe it was February. And on this particular weekend, a church from uh, up in the suburbs of Pittsburgh and Pleasant Hills uh, decided to uh, hold a retreat for members who were interested that would take place about an hour away at the Ligonier Valley Study Center. Uh, one of the men who came from that church to that retreat, where, by the way, my father taught uh, the folks that came, one of those men was a gentleman by the name of Wayne Alderson. Wayne Alderson had been uh, a soldier during World War II. And when he was signed up, he was a private, and when he signed up uh, in his particular uh, squad or platoon, he volunteered to be uh, the point man. Now, the point man is the fellow who goes first. And he doesn't last long, usually. He, he is out in front with no, one, no protection in front of him. Wayne's best friend um, was the scout. He's the fellow who's right behind the point man. Well, it happened in God's providence that as the Germans were retreating across uh, France after D-Day, and the Allied forces were pushing the uh, Axis forces back, when they got to that place where they came to uh, the border between Germany and France, and as the Americans were preparing to invade Germany, it happened that this particular uh, army group was chosen and this particular uh, division of this army group was chosen and this particular uh, platoon of this army thing and this particular squad all the way down to Wayne Alderson. He was the very first man, very first American soldier to cross over the German lines in the context of World War II. Now, there were others, of course, who parachuted over, or who snuck over, but this is in terms of the advancing army. Wayne Alderson was the very first one. He had to run across a, a great open field uh, from the French side to the German side, and when he got to the German side, he, along with his friend, the scout, leapt into a uh, bunker there, and they realized that everybody else had retreated. The fire had been so hot that everybody else had retreated. Now you've got these two men by themselves in this bunker. Well, they had been trained for situations like this, and they began to move their way through the bunker. And the way they did it was this. They would sort of come to a, uh, an angle in the border where you couldn't see the other side. And uh, Red, the scout, would toss a grenade over that corner, and after it went off, uh, Wayne would jump out with a submachine gun and start firing away in case there's anybody still there. And they were working their way down through this uh, foxhole, doing this work, when uh, Red tossed that grenade, and uh, Wayne jumped out, uh, maybe at the right time, but not after the grenade had gone off, because when he jumped out, there was a German soldier standing there holding the grenade and holding the pin, or not the pin, but holding the lever so it wouldn't go off. Well, the German tossed it. 
right back at Wayne, and Wayne, angry, fired on the German and killed him. But the grenade went off in his feet. He was badly hurt. He turned, he fell backwards, and he turned, and his friend Red wrapped his arms around him, and as the Germans came rushing toward them, Red turned his back to the Russians and protected Wayne as he was gunned down. Wayne was able to scramble out of the foxhole and run back across the open field, still with great, uh, a great firefight going on. Uh, but he made it to safety, and he went to the hospital and uh, survived the war. Fast forward 10 years or so, and Wayne is at that church. Also at that church is my father. Only my father is in high school at this point. So is my mother at the church and in high school. And Wayne is one of the basketball coaches of the church's basketball team. And that's how my father got to know him. Now you fast forward 20 years. And in the interim, Wayne has climbed the corporate ladder. And he has become a vice president of a steel mill. There are lots of steel mills in Pittsburgh. Well... My dad sees his old friend and engages him in conversation, and he asks Wayne, Wayne, how does Jesus impact your work? And Wayne was puzzled by the question, didn't quite get it, and said, well, I don't know what you mean. I, I work in a steel mill. I, I can't bring Jesus into a steel mill. And my dad said, you think about that. And Wayne did. Wayne went back to work. By the way, this particular steel mill was the least productive steel mill of all the steel mills, uh, not necessarily in the city, but on this massive international company's uh, list of steel mills. Highest accident rate, highest absentee rate, most labor uh, discord, all of those things. And Wayne did something very simple. He got to know the men in the mill. He would stand at the entrance to the mill and greet them when men came into work. And he would engage them in conversation. He would learn about their families. When the men left at the end of a shift, he would greet these men as they were walking out. He treated these men like men. And turn the place around completely. Not that that's that important. The important thing is that he treated men like men. And he began to teach executives, laborers, all around the Pittsburgh area what was called the value of the person. Now it's called Theory R. I'm not sure. I think R stands for respect. But the idea is that instead of labor and management looking at each other's enemies, they need to look at each other's as fellow humans and exercise peace and grace toward each other. I should mention that after uh, this particular steel mill had its great comeback in terms of now having the highest level of productivity, the least absenteeism, no labor strife, etc., I should mention to you that there was an accident. I don't know if you've ever uh, watched a uh, Steeler game set in Pittsburgh at night. If you haven't, I'm sorry for you. But almost every time, if not every time, the Steelers play in Pittsburgh on Sunday night uh, or Monday night or Thursday night and it's on national television. They'll almost always show an image uh, of a giant ladle filled with molten steel, liquid steel. That's how hot it is. It's melted. It's this bright glowing orange and it's this great ladle. And those things exist in steel mills. And those ladles run on tracks and then they pour that molten steel into what are called molds. It's, it's quite fascinating. Well, at this particular mill where Wayne worked, 
I don't know if I mentioned, uh, not only did he uh, have a lunchtime Bible study there, but they met right underneath the very furnace that heated up that steel to make it molten steel. Uh, well, this particular day, something went wrong. And this ladle was pouring molten steel like it was supposed to, but then it started moving along the track, which it wasn't supposed to do while it was pouring molten steel, so that it ended up pouring molten steel the entire length of the factory floor. A huge, huge accident, but nobody was hurt. The interesting thing, too, though, in one of the lockers where men would come and change into these work clothes, one of the lockers, a man's boots, steel in the steel-toed boots, had melted. That's how hot it was. But right beside those boots was a Bible, unharmed by the fire. They call both that event and the recovery of that steel mill the miracle of Pitron. And it all happened in God's good providence because my good earthly father asked Wayne that simple question. How does Jesus impact how you work with people? Now, I was blessed uh, you know, about the time I was in junior high, I was blessed to be able to uh, fairly often travel around with Wayne and my dad as they would go and give this seminar on the value of the person. I, they did it in hospitals. Uh, at that time period, uh, not far from our home, uh, the very first foreign car manufacturing plant opened in the United States. It was a Gulf uh, or a VW plant uh, in New Stanton, Pennsylvania. It was just up the turnpike, uh, one exit. So uh, the, that uh, those employees would come over to the Ligonier Valley Study Center and learn this stuff. Uh, I got to spend time with Wayne. And by the way, Wayne was a I don't know how to put it. He was a hero. He was an uncle. He was a father. He was a a prof he had a profound influence on my life. Because you know, it's not just asking the question, how does Jesus impact how I behave at work? Yeah, that's kind of a uh, a descriptive question. The better question would probably be the uh, imperative kind. What should my relationship with Jesus, how should my relationship with Jesus impact my work, my relationship with my customers, my relationship with my vendors, my relationship with my coworkers, my relationship with those who work for me, my relationship with those that I work for? One of the things that the gospel teaches us to do is simply to remember the universal humanity of all men and all women. I remember being at those seminars and, and Wayne and my dad talking about how uh, men would dip their heads. That If you were in management at the steel mill and you were uh, walking somewhere and you're going to cross paths with a uh, union member in your management, you, you, you drop your head so that you don't have to look them in the eye. And simply acknowledging that person, that's what those handshakes were all about. This wasn't a negotiating tool. This wasn't a, uh, and, and by the way, there are people who do that and teach that nonsense, who turn this glorious humanity recognizing thing into just manipulation and it never will work. <laughs> In fact, I remember, I remember once I had a job where part of my responsibility was uh, to do outbound calling to make sales and, uh, I was terrible at it. And the day that I made my first sale, 
uh, I happened to mention it to my sales manager, and he just gave me this wonderful glowing speech, and how he knew I'd be a great salesman, and blah, 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 blah. And I mean, if I could have looked inside his brain, I would have seen the footnote from the management book he read about the, how important it is to do that. There was nothing sincere about it at all. But with Wayne, it was. Wayne was sincere because Wayne, he's one of these guys who had a rough life. And in his conversion, he carried over some of that roughness. And God in his grace kind of, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, uh, when you, you, where you make a river go in a particular place, diverted. He diverted that, uh, some of those hard places into courage. Because you need to know this, too. I should have mentioned this earlier. It was this time period when this was going on, when the steel industry in Pittsburgh was crumbling quickly, when labor, where labor unrest was huge across the city. But at Pitron, there was peace. At Pitron, there was a shared, uh, a shared commitment. By the way, not only did Wayne and my dad speak, but also they had, uh, on the same team, they had some uh, powerful union guys, Lefty Scamachi and uh, uh, Sam Piccolo. Sam Piccolo, by the way, was the brother of Brian Piccolo, uh, the star of, uh, well, the, the character uh, that James Caan played in the original uh, Brian song. Well... I'm telling you this, not so you think, oh, what a neat story. I'm telling you this so that you can have the same story. What would happen if you would go into your workplace and if you would treat people with grace and tenderness and care? What if you just looked them in the eye and said hello? What if you asked their name and learned their name? You've heard the old expression, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. There's a place to go. I, I, friends, I, I, all I know is my own sins, and I, I know I struggle with this. I know that I can, I can look at unbelievers as my enemies, which in some senses they are, but the way we're supposed to look at them is with compassion. We're supposed to love our enemies. We're supposed to have pity on them. It doesn't mean that we don't treat them with dignity. It does mean we have concern for them. So when I do these gospel at work segments, that, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to spread this simple concept. It doesn't need to be a movement. If it becomes a movement, it won't be sincere. But what would happen if just, I don't know, all of you who are listening, not that many of you listen, but all of you who are listening, what would happen if you made a concerted effort to treat everyone you run into with dignity and respect? What would happen if you looked at the worst sinner you'll ever meet and think to yourself, that's what I would be without the grace of God? Wayne Alderson passed away probably five or ten years ago, maybe maybe a little longer. And he was he was the first man that I could say without any shame, and he would say it to me too, that I loved. I loved Wayne Alderson, and I like to believe that the reason I loved Wayne Alderson is because Wayne Alderson. Love Jesus. Let's be the point man. Let's go into the battle. Not dropping grenades, not firing submachine guns, but let's go into the battle of our work day. Armed with the gospel. Let's bring the gospel to work. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast,
podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsporjr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.